Welcome to Shattered Reality, with your hosts Kate Valentine and Farusha. Prepare to have your paradigms shifted and your truths questioned. And now, Shattered Reality. Shattered Reality. Shattered reality. Hello and welcome. This is Kate Valentine, welcoming At- you to the program. And I'm Farusha. Welcome to Shattered Reality. And we certainly hope you help us to shatter some paradigms today. Well, if anyone will do it, it will be our guest today, Mr. Mac Maloney. Mac is a wonderful author of UFO books. One of them is Beyond Area 51, and the other is UFOs in Wartime, which is one of my all-time favorite UFO books. Loved it. He has also written a series of, uh, I guess you would say, fiction books under the Wingman series. And so, with all that, welcome to the show, Mac. Thank you for being with us this hour. Well, uh, thanks for having me, Kate. (laughs) <laughs> Always a pleasure. Well, on, on both of your books, uh, I think the overwhelming impact that we get from it is that UFOs indeed do exist. Uh, you sort of uh, demonstrate that beyond any reasonable doubt. And what you do not do, and which I like, is draw any conclusions as to what they are. And until we gather more consistent data, unfortunately, that will remain the case, I think. Um, no, yeah, I agree with you. It's, um, you know, there's certainly a lot of theories as to what UFOs are out there, but I think we can all agree that no one really knows what they are. We've never really seen any proof that anyone knows. We've heard a lot of conjecture and theories and, you know, just kind of out-and-out fabrications in a lot of cases. But uh, I think that Outstanding proof is uh, yet to be found. I think that's sometime in our future. I just hope it's in our near future. Well, uh, yeah, me too. I'll tell you, the older I get, the closer I hope the answers come. But um, one of the things, one of the points that another guest made is that uh, we're keeping the UFO secret. The UFOs are certainly not keeping themselves secret. I mean, they're all over the place and uh, all through time, really. I mean, you know, obviously... I'm sure a lot of our listeners know the biblical accounts, uh, the medieval accounts, the uh, wartime, which you've so well documented, accounts. And uh, so they're right in your face. It's just that we just don't, they just don't give us enough information as to know what they are. But I, I think Farusha had some uh, ideas. Um, you know, uh, Mac, I, I appreciate your open-minded point that um, you are not uh, going to come down uh, definitively as to what UFOs are, but I know that you have, uh, shall we say, a pet theory or your personal opinion, uh, which may involve time travelers. Is that the case? Mm-hmm. Well, uh, yes, it is, to tell you the truth, and I'm not the first one to come up with it, but in just in researching uh, the books, especially UFOs in wartime, it just seems like, um, as we were saying just a minute ago, that UFOs don't make any pretense of not being there. People think UFOs kind of hide, but they don't. They, they're they always kind of there, and they just seem to be, um, you know, watching us, and, um, and, and it's proof that it has been proved that they show up at historic events, especially during World War II with the Foo Fighters. And if you just keep reading that over and over... <clears throat> It just pops into your head that, hey, maybe they're just time cars. Maybe they're, to- they're time machines from our own future coming back and watching history being made. Well, that sounds like a, a very viable theory. Um, just going forward with that a little bit, do you think that it's possible, A, that UFOs may be more than one thing, which is to say that, you know, let's say 80% of the UFOs that are actual, real uh, accounts as opposed to hoaxes or misinterpretations, maybe 80% of those um, are time travelers. Do you hold out any thought that maybe uh, the other 10 or 20% might be, let us say, extraterrestrial visitors or ultra-terrestrials, that is, um, another race that may not be in our um, exactly in our view, but that cohabits the Earth with us, perhaps uh, in a different um, in a different dimensional plane, or perhaps somehow hidden. Mm-hmm. 
Well, you know, anything is possible. I mean, just take, for example, the thing that we can closely associate it to is when people go on <clears throat> safaris in Africa, for instance, and, you know, you, you ride around in the truck and people take pictures of the lions and the elephants and so on. <clears throat> Those animals have no idea what the tourists are up to, if you exactly. know what I mean. Exactly, exactly. You know, they, it, so they just go on with their, you know, daily life. And and there's just this thing kind of there that, you know, they can't understand, so they, they almost don't pay attention to it. That's how it is here with UFOs. You know, we see them, we hear about them all the time, but because they're always there and they don't do anything except kind of appear, you know, they're not as, um, to some people, they just uh, either don't exist or they're just not exciting enough to kind of, um, you know, talk about or get interested in. But, you know, there's, there's, look at how many tourist companies there are that bring people all over the world. So why wouldn't we think that, you know, especially since people see certain kinds of UFOs through the years, through, through the hundreds of years, people have seen flying saucers, but they also see cigar-shaped objects, and they also see kind of balls of light. So there are different kinds of UFOs, so who's to say that all, all, a different kind of UFO comes from a different place? Oh, that's, I'm glad that you are open to that idea, and I think sometimes of um, the uh, cargo cults, uh, famously of the South Pacific, where people... Um, uh, that were on isolated islands associated the, the actual uh, warplanes uh, with uh, cargo coming from gods. You know, the, they might get chocolates from uh, the John f from America and then raise John from America to a god. R right. And, and, you know, you can really kind of uh, take that example and, and, and stretch it out, um, you know, a lot because that's kind of like a... Um, a test bed of what would happen if, um, well, especially the ancient astronaut theory, uh, people who are into that theory, really love what happened with the cargo coats because you can almost see it happening, you know, where there's people on the ground, they're, they're, they're very much people of the earth, they're not, uh, you know, technologically advanced. Something comes down that just kind of blows their minds. They're going to think that it's, you know, some kind of a higher power and so on and so forth. That's what happened in the Pacific when we were fighting World War II and planes landed on these isolated islands. Could very well happen 5,000 years ago when a uh, flying saucer came down in, um, you know, ancient Egypt or something like that. Um, one thing that was sure is that we're sure of is that UFOs have appeared uh, to humans throughout human history, throughout human history. It, it's one of the few things that has been with us from the very beginning and is still around today. So I think that just adds to the mystery. Yeah, and I also have always felt that this planet is almost like the paradise of Eden that was described in the Bible. I mean, as many exoplanets as they've discovered, they all seem to have some glitch in it. And as far as planets being friendly and stable enough to develop intelligent or technologically competent life, I don't think they're very common. I mean, as far as we know, it took four billion years for a technological society to exist on this planet. So I think they're fairly rare, and I think they would indeed draw interest. I mean, after all, we are the UFOs of Mars right now. If Martians mm -hmm. exist, they'd take us as UFOs, as extraterrestrial visitors. So I, I don't think it would be a huge leap of imagination uh, to imagine uh, archaeologists from Alpha Centauri being here. But I, I mean, as far what we sometimes forget to uh, think about too is the drama of UFOs. And I love this article about the Battle of Los Angeles. And if I may quote from your book, uh, in the early morning hours of February twenty fifth, nineteen forty two, the city of Los Angeles was attacked by UFOs. Now that's a blunt, factual statement, Mister Maloney. <laughs> <laughs> and it's backed up. It says, it might sound like the opening of a science fiction book or the first line from a movie script, but it actually happened in front of one million witnesses. And that's actually true. And they have a wonderful photograph of the UFO being caught in searchlights of missiles blowing up all around it. Uh, and let's just say for, let's just uh, take all speculation aside and say, yes, this really happened, and this is what it was. Uh, right away, the government hops in and said, no, nope, no, nope, move along, nothing to see here. Uh, and as I uh, asked you before, what are your thoughts as far as the government keeping this so 
uh, it, you know, the giggle factor and all that. And anybody that brings it up is thought to be a little bit loose. Uh, so what are your thoughts? Why would our our government, and it seems all governments, why do they cover this up so so very carefully? Well, um, it, it's speaking strictly for the American, you know, government and the military, it is just there. This is the way that they um, started out in the early days. Actually, when they started out in the first six months or so, of 1947 after Kenneth Arnold's sighting, um, actually the last six months of 1947, the Air Force really looked into it. They spent a lot of money. They had engineers and, and scientists look into it, and their conclusion after that first six months was that UFOs are not of this earth. We didn't make them. The Russians didn't make them. They could find no evidence of anyone around the world who could make you know, these flying machines that people were seeing that do all these fantastic things. So they br- actually brought that report to the... Pentagon and the Pentagon, you know, in their way said that, well, this isn't the conclusion we wanted. So they went back and did another report and they whitewashed the whole thing. And in that report, they said that that what they found, they completely turned around their findings. They said what they found was that anyone who saw a UFO uh, was someone who was hallucinating or they were a religious fanatic or they were someone who was causing a hoax. And and that has been kind of like the the foundation of, of of the U.S. military's response ever since that moment. You've got to be crazy, it's got to be a trick, or you're some kind of a fanatic. Okay. And, and you see, what, what, and what real quick, is what, where they ran into problems is in Korea, the Korean War starts a couple of years later, and our pilots start seeing UFOs, and they couldn't say, well, our pilots are either hoaxes or fanatics, or, you know, they have something, some mental instability. So um, that's when the, uh, the uh, U.S. military just stopped commenting on UFOs Completely. To, to that point, Mac, um, it seems to me, having gone to a, a few UFO conventions and having been a member of MUFON, that a lot of the people who express interest in UFOs in terms of organizations at any rate um, are former military men and Air Force people. And um, I don't suppose that they all could be disinformation agents. Uh, no, that would be uh, almost impossible, would it? I mean, yes, um, yes. <laughs> that, that, see, that's another thing too is that people are, are saying um, that, and, and this goes kind of to uh, uh, the other side is that, you know, we think of you know your typical uh, person who has a UFO sighting as someone. It's usually in a rural a rural area. Um, they're usually alone or only another couple people with them. There's uh, usually just you know no one else around for miles and miles. Uh, this seems to be the, the, the place where UFOs choose to uh, show themselves to us. But what maybe some people forget is that airline pilots and military pilots see them all the time. They see them all the time, and now they see UFOs all the time, uh, but a lot of them are explained. But you see these people, because they see them, they, they see so much in the sky day in and day out. They know that's Venus. They know that's the moon. They know that's a mountaintop with snow on it. They know that's a reflection off of, you know, uh, oil uh, fields in the desert. And then they know when this thing looks like nothing else they've ever seen. So our military pilots and our airline pilots see these things all the time. That is, there's no doubt about it. The problem is, is that in the military, if you start talking about UFOs, you're probably not going to have very much flight time given to you afterwards, and it's going to affect your advancement uh, up, the, up the ranks. It's, it's just proven. If you talk about UFOs, you're not going to get promoted as quickly as if uh, you didn't talk about it. And then the airlines, it's the same thing, too. They don't want pilots up there saying they're seeing UFOs because it seems unsafe that they'd be flying up a line full of passages. That's uh, true. Uh, we're talking to Mr. Mac Maloney. He is the author of UFOs in Wartime and Beyond Area 51. And, and yeah, I, I have to agree with you. It's still the giggle factor is enough. It's a career killer. If you were in science and you said, you know, I'm a physicist. These objects exist. They're showing uh, flight criteria that do not exist today. Let's find out how to do it. Yeah, good luck getting a grant on that one. And right, yet, exactly. it would be so feasible. I mean, obviously they exist. They are objects. I mean, there is a lot of you know speculation about them being interdimensional and spiritual and all that. But some of them, at least, are absolutely objects. I mean, certainly the Phoenix Lights, that thing that flew over Sky Harbor, uh, was an object, and uh, mm-hmm. it, uh, it 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 should be investigated. 
or researched. What What do you think of the some of the recent, you know, more or less 21st century a well-known UFO sightings such as uh, a Chicago O'Hare or mm. Phoenix Lights, which was the end of, I guess, the 20th century, mm-hmm. huh? and, and Stephenville, those those more prominent U.S. cases. What, how do you come down on those, Mac? Well, uh, something obviously happened at, in both places. Something obviously happened in uh, at O'Hare uh, Airport in Chicago because, once again, um, it was just an unusual case because it happened during the day, for one thing. Yeah. And plus, you had a lot of people who worked at the airport saw it. You know, so once again, you have people who are familiar with airplanes, familiar with airplanes, look like, sound like what they look like 20 miles out, 10 miles out when they're landing in fog at night. You know, they know what these things look like. And when they see something that doesn't look like something they've ever seen before, then that is really, you know, that's that's, that's really quite a, an amazing sighting. And that's what happened in Chicago, obviously. And, um, and then in uh, Phoenix, same thing. It's very interesting in Phoenix that, uh, you know, you will see film of um, – lights kind of disappearing behind a mountain. Some gentleman had his uh, video camera out, and, and they kind of, you see the lights kind of blinking out, and, and there has been a, um explanation for that because they you enhance the video and you see that there are actually airplanes dropping flares, and, and what they're blinking out is that they're going down behind this mountain. Okay, that's fine. A lot of people see that and they say, well, that's, that was the reason for the, uh, that's the explanation for the Phoenix Lights. But what they don't realize is that this enormous triangle-shaped object flew over the heads of dozens, if not hundreds, of people during a, 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 a hundred-mile flight going, you know, in the Phoenix area. People saw, they weren't seeing lights. They were seeing something the size of an aircraft carrier fly over them. Right, that's an object. It was picked up on radar. Hundreds of people saw it. The military is aware of it. I mean, that's one of the best sightings ever as well. And, and because a lot of people have looked into it and there's a lot of literature about it, that I think that proves that it's one of the best sightings. And, you know, this is the point that I always get stuck on, too. Uh, air traffic controllers are extraordinarily responsible people. They have to be. And uh, there is some governmental force that quiets these people down, that forces them to lie. And I don't think it's the uh, the government that we come to know, because I think there's too much of a risk of their being found out as far as uh, sort of shushing up air traffic controllers. I think this is a totally extra governmental force that will come in, because they pop up within hours. I mean, we're not talking all week later. You know, I mean, our government moves at snail pace, and uh, these people, whoever they are, they're like, well, I heard about this sighting. Two minutes later, they're there up in the tower with the air traffic controllers. So there is some really highly regimented force out there beside the giggle factor uh, to keep these things quiet. And I always wonder why. I mean, what, what is it that they're hiding? Well, I, you know, <laughs> yeah, who are they? Yeah, yeah, who are they? That's the question. Is but you know, it's funny because I, I kind of look at that question from a different angle. Um, when we say what are they hiding, I think what it is is I think they are trying to find out stuff. Oh. I have uh, the impression that the U.S. military they know more about UFOs than the, than they're letting on. But I am not convinced at all that they know what UFOs are. I think that they are just as big a mystery to people in our government as they are to you, to us right now. Mm. And because, once again, there is really no concrete evidence that uh, that we have flying saucers, that we have technology, you know, reverse engineers from, from flying saucers and so on and so forth. Plus, you hear, for instance, I've talked on you know, a number of radio shows and talked to people who have been interviewed, and a lot of times there will be interference on the line when a UFO author is talking to a radio station like right now, okay? Um, it's happened to me a number of times, and it's happened to a lot of people I've talked to. And everyone always seems to think, well, you know, they're, they're, they want to know, you know, they're, they're, they're listening in, they're eavesdropping because they're the government and they want to stop us. How about maybe they're listening because they are trying to get information from us, if you know what I mean. Maybe they think we know more than they do, or they are just trying to pick up every kernel of information they can. And if it comes from someone in a UFO book who did research that maybe someone in the government hasn't done or hasn't heard about, then you're going to start, you know, eavesdropping on them. Um, I, I just am of the opinion that the U.S. military does not know as much as we think they know about them, and I think that they that puts them in the hot seat because we spend so much money on defense in this country 
they cannot admit they don't know what things are uh, flying around up there. Making a short detour into the world of ufology, um, it, you know, the, the people, the UFO, ufology people, we would have to say then you come down more on the Colonel John B. Alexander side than the Richard Dolan side. Uh, well, I know both of them. Um, and um, I, I, I'm, I'm not on anyone's side. I, I don't mean that you're taking sides. I just mean no. opinion. I'm somewhere wrote in, opinions. I'm, I'm, I'm of. like a little bit out in left field from both of those guys. Okay. Um, I've talked to both of them, and I know that they kind of represent uh, two points of view. But, um, you know, I think that for both of them, they raise points a lot of times that, you know, are worthy of a good, solid debate. Um, I don't believe in the secret space program that I know Richard is very passionate about. It just doesn't add up. There just isn't enough um, evidence out there, or if you really kind of look into it, you would have to have this massive secret spaceport that the United States military has had for dozens of years with logistics that would involve tens of thousands of people, and none of these people have ever talked, none of them has ever gone to the Inquirer or 60 Minutes, these days, we can't even trust SEAL team members from keeping quiet. Mm. The two of them come out and wrote a book about shooting bin Laden. Oh. What makes anyone think that the thousands and thousands of people that would have to work for a secret space program if it exists, how do you keep all those people quiet? It would be impossible. Where do you come so, down on the deathbed-type confessions of some of these former military people, some of which were who were at Roswell, other of whom are just random military guys uh, on deathbed type confessions. Right. Well, you know, once again, it's um, and, and, and there's a little bit of an emotional factor when uh, a story comes out that is a deathbed confession. But you know, just to look at it, um, you know, with a blank slate, let's say, you know. Did the person really say what he said? I mean, I hate to say it, but when someone's dying, you don't want to have a video camera running, but, you know, there's no evidence like that, you know. It's right. always hearsay. It's always hearsay, deathbed confessions, because we don't have very rarely other is there electronic equipment there to record it. So it, you have to kind of take that just like as any other claim, and, and it has to hold up the scrutiny. If it isn't, if it doesn't, then, you know, uh, you have to dispel it. Well, coming into secrecy, we're going to get right into your book, Mr. Mac Maloney, Beyond Area 51, uh, where you talk about all these secret military bases that have gone on uh, from, again, biblical times. You talk about Megiddo, which is fascinating, and uh, and so on. But uh, Stanton Freeman always said that, too. He said, look how many uh, tens of thousands of people worked on the atomic bomb, and that was kept secret. But uh, again, as he mentions as well, that was a different time in history, and people were much more patriotic. At that and, point. and plus, it wasn't kept secret. There was uh, four or five Soviet agents ah, that were right. leaking back information to Russia all the time. So it was actually a poorly kept secret. Yeah, but it never made it out to the general public. Until no, that's true. The Rosenbergs later, but and it, and it was a different time. There was no National Enquirer. Yeah. There was no twenty-four hour news cycle, and so on. Correct. Yeah, it was a whole different time in history. It is now. You know, talking about interference, Mr. <laughs> Macaloni. How about that? We're just sitting here, the three of us. Uh, everything's been going on is the way it has been going on, and then boom, it goes dead. Nobody touched the. Controls. No one touched anything. We're all listening. Wow. Well, it has happened, uh, you know, it has happened many times. It, 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 as you know, we talked off here, you, you, your show was the first one I was ever interviewed on. It's probably three years ago now or more. Yeah, yeah. And I've been interviewed uh, dozens of times since. And I have to say that that has happened, you know, a good 15, 16 times to me over, over the past two years where you're just talking along and something happens to the equipment. It doesn't happen when... The radio station's talking to a florist or a sports person. It's always yeah. just seemed to be the yeah. UFO person. Something about that, those that florists, I will admit happens. You know, a lot of stuff I don't believe happens, but I, I will admit that that has happened to me a number of times, so many times that it has to be more than a coincidence. Okay, well, here's a real scary experiment, and I'm going to put it out, and this is just involving myself, Kate Valentine, but if you're listening, I just want you to know. I know what they are, and I'm going to publish. Now let's see what they do about that one. <laughs> the most egregious uh, example uh -huh. that I have ever encountered yeah. um, is when anyone tries to interview 
Richard Souter or Sauter. I don't know how he pronounces his name. You can't uh, even get him anymore. No, he's, he he's is disappeared. just, uh, and he's tried to come on a few programs, and the interference, mm. the the um, uh, well, the changing of the timber of the voice, and the whole thing, yeah. uh, you know, wah wah wahing out is mm-hmm. unbelievable, unbelievable. He can never be gotten to uh, for very long. Right. Right. Uh, and then wow. another thing that happened to Ferusha and a good friend of ours who unfortunately has passed on, but we were doing a whole show with a uh, engineer, uh, Dave, who was phenomenal, and Bill was there, and it was being recorded, I think, on three different things, right, Bill? And uh, at the end of the show, you know, I was going to give them both a copy of the recording. It had completely disappeared. And we were not talking about anything in particular, uh, but... Uh, Nothing too top was, secret, I yeah, would no, say. No, definitely not. <laughs> and uh, not like the secret I have. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tempt fate. I know. will, indeed, I know. <laughs> and when a bright blue light comes in the bedroom window tonight, you're going to see just how fast I can run. <laughs> I'll just leave the dog behind. <laughs> <laughs> well, I understand they don't like dogs, but that's oh, just really? Like, so well, her name is Kate, so. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, poor Kate. I remember Kate. Anyway, Mac, was sorry for that little uh, diversion. Okay. I um, understand. So, you know, um, you have chronicled and other people have chronicled how uh, certain air bases have been shut down the uh, the silos with the the nuclear missiles in uh, you know Minot and uh, a couple of the other Maelstrom and Minot I believe and there are probably others where the silos have been um, shut down by a UFO overhead and uh, certainly I really do believe that um, that these things occurred and that no one knows who it was that did it and if we follow that through what happened uh, then with the Japanese problem that we have now, the uh, Fukushima after the uh, it, the uh, that the, reactor, the nuclear the reactor right. there, the the three to five reactors there that uh, have uh, burned, um, you mm. know, burned off and uh, have created an incredible environmental mess. Where were the UFOs then? Yeah, well, they're not looking out for us. I think that's it. They're just here to see, you know, how badly we can mess things up. Uh, I, I think they're having, I think they have like a sort of a twisted sense of humor. You know, like maybe they're like. <laughs> okay. Well, see, you know, I mean, it, it could be just that. It could be just some kind of a sense of humor going back to this idea of, of time tourism. tourism. Yeah. You know, if there was some time in 20 years, 100 years from now where we could go back in the future and see some kind of something that we've always wanted to see. I mean, who yeah. wouldn't do that? Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah. And some people would, they would want to go see World War II refought, you know, for instance. A lot of UFOs there. You know, someone said to me, I would love to go see a Shakespeare play, a real Shakespeare play. I would like to go see the Battle of Troy. I would like to go see, you know, all these different kind of historical events. And, and when you kind of, you know, kind of backfill that idea, you say, well, let's see, you know, there's always been UFOs showing up at historical events and at other events. You know, maybe, I don't know, the whole time traveling thing kind of just fills in a lot of holes for me. And maybe, you know, people want to go back and look at, you know, what happened at Fukushima, you know, what happened with the earthquake, with the tidal wave and, you know, the mm-hmm. disaster that they have now. It's a bigger disaster apparently than Chernobyl. And, um, you know, they, once again, getting back right back to the, the bottom line of UFOs, they, they look like they're observing. They look like they're looking in on us. Yes, and, yes. Um, and um, that, I don't know, time travel just it fills a lot of holes for me for some reason. Well, you know, one thing that um, you brought up, I think that a lot of people who are interested in UFO, ufology are aware of of the um, the things going on with World War II, not to the extent that you chronicled them, but but are very much less familiar with the ghost rockets of World War One, which you chronicled. So maybe you'd like to tell us a little bit about that, because you know, previous to looking at at, at your literature here, I was somewhat unaware of that phenomena. Well, there was um, uh, it, the uh, there was the ghost flyers of 1932. And then the ghost rockets of 1946, and then in 1908, these huge, huge um, blimp-like objects, airships, where they called them scare ships, were spotted over England. Now the interesting thing was, 
that as far as the scare ships are concerned, there were no huge Zeppelins in 1908 that could make it from Germany to England, yet people saw these things. In uh, Ghost Flyers um, of 1932, people up in the very northern part of Sweden saw these very strange airplanes that no one has ever been able to figure out what they were. They had eight engines. They were flying over snow and tundra, yet they had pontoons that you would need to land on water. There wasn't any water around for hundreds of miles. And then in 1946, over Sweden, once again, these ghost rockets that appeared at first to be like maybe V-1 buzz bombs from World War II, German, uh, you know, uh, surplus, but then a, a pilot, a uh, Swedish pilot, actually rode alongside one of these things. And the way his description reads is the exact description of a cruise missile from 1985 or so. Wow. So you take these three incidents, and it's almost like an offshoot of, of UFOs because they weren't the classic UFOs, saucer-shaped or cigar-shaped objects. They were just these strange pieces of technology that look like they're a little bit out of time. Um, 1908, as, again, you couldn't fly a Zeppelin from Germany to England. They weren't advanced enough. Four, four or five years later, you could. Mm -hmm. In 1932, there was no such thing as an eight-engined plane. Four or five years later, the Russians built one. Um, you know, in 1946, people are seeing what amount to cruise missiles that weren't invented for another 40 years. Something about those three incidents almost looks like there was some kind of technology that was caught out of time or something. Right, right. And um, no one has ever explained, no one has ever come forward on any of those cases and say, you know, I was involved in that and so on. They're complete blank mysteries, one of the best mysteries in all of this kind of big UFO puzzle. Like a, like a sort of a, a time slip. Or something, yeah. Yep. Mm. Yeah, very strange, those three incidents. Well, they had that in Texas, too, didn't they? I'm yeah, they sorry. had the airships, airships in Texas and the Midwest, um, I believe, in the late 1890s, and there were lots of people who purportedly saw them. And yeah. uh, the odd thing about that is, if, if I recall correctly, is that, that the people within the ship would throw down an anchor. And this mm -hmm. also happened in the Middle Ages in England, where a sh an airship would be seen in, and the the occupants would throw down almost like a nautical anchor, which was sort of really bizarre, but it was reported more than once. Is that not mm -hmm. the case? Yeah. Uh, it's, but that, you know, we all have our pet theories, and mine is that I, I do think there's another intelligent species on this planet uh, that is not as numerous as we are, and given our proclivities, they realize if they experience you know, if we knew of them, we'd probably try to exterminate them almost immediately. Go the way of the passenger pigeon, there as you it go. were. There you go. Or the Neanderthals, for that matter. Yeah, well, I think I'm probably part Neanderthal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know. I'll let that one go. But, uh, you know, so I, I really think there is something else here, just another uh, civilization somewhere that tends to be just not as populous as ours, but is pretty... Uh, scientifically oriented and pretty technologically oriented. And uh, do, do you think um, I, I like that theory? Do you think that they all know about each other, or are they people who are just individuals who are not part oh, of? Oh, I see we are? what you mean. You mean like highly individual individuals? That's stupid. Mm -hmm. But you know, uh, I don't know. No, I was thinking of like a small civilization, a small city state. Almost oh, like okay. ancient Greece, but uh, that would be interesting too. Just a pocket here and a pocket there. Mm -hmm. Huh? I would. I, wow. I would <laughs> fall more on the side of something being um, in a different vibrational pattern than we are. So they could be right here amongst us, but like vibrating at a faster level to the extent mm. that we couldn't see them, just as we generally mm -hmm. don't see, uh, you know, infrared and ultraviolet. But maybe our cats can. Yeah. Right, right. I mean, there's an incident uh, that we I just spoke to Paul Eno, who is a uh, UFO investigator and also has his own radio show. He was telling me about this incident in the middle of Connecticut a few years ago, and it and it had it was like the perfect storm of the paranormal. Uh, it started off with a haunted house, a house that had been haunted for many, many years. People have been describing really and seeing really very strange, bizarre ghost-like uh, activity in this particular house. And then all of a sudden, people started seeing UFOs around this house. Hmm. Uh, right when they started to kind of uh, redo it and, and kind of spruce the place up, UFOs start showing up around this place. And then um, a little bit later, uh, people started seeing military people in the area, and hmm. people were hiking and so on, and they'd run into 
a couple army MPs who would tell them, you can't go this way, you got to turn around and go back. Um, something was going on in the middle of Connecticut wow. that um, has this this element of, of um, you know, ghostly activity and also UFO activity. And, and other people I've talked to lately are now kind of coming to grips maybe with the theory that all of this stuff is connected. It's like, you know, the universal theory, uh, universal, united, universal field theory of okay. the paranormal. UFOs are connected to ghosts. Ghosts are connected to Bigfoot. Bigfoot is connected to the Loch Ness, so on and so forth. Cryptids. That if, if, yeah, if it was all one big thing, I think that would be unbelievably fascinating. If it was just all part, all these things are just part of one big thing that we mm. just don't know what it is yet. Mm. I yes. think that would be fascinating. Well, that yeah. is especially fascinating, I think, to Kate and I, simply because that area is within striking distance of uh, yeah. of our location here. And not mm-hmm. only that, what about the big cats that are seen in Connecticut sometimes? Mm-hmm. Uh, do you think that could be possibly part of all of this? Sure. You know, you never know. I mean, big cats have been seen, spotted in um, in England for hundreds of years. And, you know, when people say big cats, they think, you know, oh, you know, a tiger or a lion is a big cat. No, these are big cats. These are cats of the size of, like, hushes and so on. And they've been spotted throughout England for, for, for centuries. No one can ever find them. They can find their footprints, but they can never find these things. They never find, you know, what they're eating or anything like that. They just seem to be there, and then they're not there anymore. And I've, I've, I know that there was an incident in Connecticut where, you know, people who were driving along um, I-95, I think, saw some huge creature standing at the side of the road for, for a few seconds, big cat. Uh, you know, who knows, you know? But it, it all does seem to be connected to this idea that we see things sometimes in our normal world that just shouldn't be there. They don't last very long, but they do happen. People see them more than one person sees them if they're, UFOs, they're picked up on radar or whatever. If they're something else, they can be picked up on camera. Um, who knows? Well, you know, it's uh, we. I had a very funny incident along that line. Uh, my son at the time was about 15. I had just picked him up from school. We were riding home. This was out in Long Island in the Riverhead area. And uh, we're, we're going back uh, along a road that ran past a number of farms. And as we pass one farmhouse... Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a man who was wearing what looked like almost uh, uh, pilgrim-type clothes or very old clothes, and right behind him was a Native American, in, not in full regalia, but obviously not in Western dress either. And it came and went so fast. And I said, I said, Matt, did you see that? And he said, yeah, what was that? Uh, to the point where I turned around and actually drove back, and there was no one there. And at that time of day, there rarely is anybody outside that particular farmhouse. And we both looked at each other. And, you know, and I think you're going to agree with me. When you see something out of the ordinary, it leaves an impression on your mind that something sort of out of the ordinary but very readily explainable uh, doesn't leave that same impression. Like you just instinctively know you've seen something that's bizarre. Right. And I had this strong feeling that these two men just looped through time and then looped right back in. Uh, certainly the settlers were there several hundred years ago. And, uh, uh, you know, the two of us just had that same feeling. It was just like that quick time flip. And, mm-hmm. uh well, there's a lot of people who have experienced similar things, you know. Yeah. Once again, through the years, it isn't these things that we see all the time, or the, what the, that we're talking about now. You know, people seem to think that they're just kind of recent uh, to our history, and, mm-hmm. and they're not. People have seen these things over um, hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, there was a um, like in England back uh, three or four hundred years ago. People used to see, and this was always very strange. They called them fetch fetches, and what it was mm-hmm. was. Uh, you know, you would be in a room with your friend. You would look out the window, and here comes your friend walking up the pathway. Mm-hmm. Uh, it used to happen a lot oh. in schools. Oh. They would, they would, they would, um, you know, they have a classroom full of kids, mm-hmm. and look out the window, and one of them would be outside playing. Wow. Um, very strange, you know. And it's almost like, whoop, that's not supposed to be there. And as soon as you think it, it's gone. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Wow. It wouldn't it be great to be able to actually know what was behind all this stuff? I mean, it, uh, it it's just such fascinating. I guess the fact that it is unknown is what makes it so fascinating. Well, I can give you a theory real quick. That, okay. 
Right. Someone told me the other right. day, okay? Uh-huh. And I think more and more about this. I never saw the movie The Matrix, but someone told me that it, it's kind of close to it. What this person, uh, who's a futurist, a, a professional futurist, uh, uh, Gray Scott is his name, lives down there in New York, and um, he writes a lot about the future and so on. His idea is that what we are really living in, us, we're li- really living in someone's computer simulation, someone's unbelievably wow. detailed computer simulation wow. um, created by someone who is a higher power, way higher power than we could ever you know, uh, imagine. Mm-hmm. And, and it's just been going along. It's just been going along. And, but what happens is when something like that happens where you see something that shouldn't be there or when you have some kind of an extraordinary coincidence, what that is, it's a glitch in the program. Hmm. Because no matter what, every computer program has a glitch in it. Hmm. And, and, you know, when you think about it, you say, well, look at, I mean, I've had coincidences in my life that are just off the charts. But you think to yourself, and, and look at how many people, people have coincidences all the time. Um, people have deja vu all the time. Um, you know, maybe these are just things that proves that the computer program we're all living in isn't infallible. Mm. Well, I th- th- that's sort of upsetting, though. I'd rather not be in a computer program. <laughs> well, but, but it, a gentleman know. that I studied uh-huh. with um, who was a former NASA rocket scientist, a physicist, and wrote a book called uh, uh, My Big Toe, uh, comes to the same conclusion uh, that uh, we're living in a computer. It's a binary world out there, and he has uh, some very advanced physics ways of proving that, and he's a, a wonderful, intelligent gentleman, and I'm trying to think of his name. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm really trying to think of his name, um, and I, I'm going to find it before the end of the show, but he, his book is My Big Toe, and it's, it really goes into great depth. I mean, it's like one of these tomes. It's three books in one. It's, it's wonderful. And toe indicating theory of everything, right? Theory of everything, yeah. right, right. Yeah, well, I, you know, there's just so much out there. This is great, Mac. And, and then we're just sort of scratching the surface. It's uh, So you, you, had, you had some interesting insights about, um, about the, what happened to the poor gentleman down in um, New Mexico who was a victim of uh, government disinformation um, and who, who was actually driven crazy by the by the government? Do you want to talk to this subject a little bit? Uh, what what turned out with the Dulce, New Mexico, that whole um, sure uh, scenario? Um, it, this gentleman was a physicist, and he had a an office right near um, Kirtland Air Force Base, which is in New Mexico. Benowitz, Evan, right? Benowitz, Paul Benowitz, Benowitz, yeah. Benowitz. Yeah, Benowitz. That came to me. And at least. and uh, what? And he was a very smart guy. And um, he noticed um, on a number of occasions, because he was so close to Kirtland Air Force Base, he noticed two things. He noticed strange things flying over the base, and he also noticed strange radio signals <clears throat> developing around the base. And he put his, the two and two he put together was that there were UFOs over the uh, uh, nuclear bunkers that they had at Kirtland Air Force Base. It was a badly kept secret that the U.S. Air Force stored a lot of nuclear bombs there. So he went to the Air Force and he, people at the base, and he, he gave them his theory. And he said, um, and they said to him, hey, you know what, you're right. And they gave him more information. They started feeding him this story that, you know, there was aliens were involved, the government was, uh, you know, aware of them, and that they were, I mean, at the very long end of this kind of disinformation campaign they played in this guy, he, they had him convinced that there were 50,000 Aliens in a in a um, in a mountain about 90 miles north of Carrollton Air Force Base called Belcher Mountain, and um, this poor guy um, went insane. He literally went insane. He was uh, institutionalized three, two or three times. He was, um, you know, went up and bought a lot of guns. He got very paranoid, and it turned out to be not true. Of course, I mean, what what he was seeing were the you know, early um, examples of stealth fighters, and the radio. Uh, waves that he was picking up, uh, radio frequencies, they were there to jam uh, Russian satellites going over Kirtland Air Force Base to, um, to, to ensure that they didn't, you know, find evidence that nuclear bombs were being kept there. Now, they could have easily told this guy, because he worked for the government at some point, you know, listen, this is what's going on. You sign a security, um, you know, uh, vow and uh, never speak of it again. But they chose to go the other way, feed him all this information, throw him completely off the, off the track, 
uh, make him the giggle fact, the poster boy for giggle factor back then. And it wound up uh, killing the guy. Hmm. Ah. So somebody was actually vicious enough to do that on purpose. They thought they oh, were... stupid enough. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. yeah. yeah, it's just a big joke. Oh, this is Mr. Mac Maloney, the author of Beyond Area Fifty One, and one of my favorite UFO books, UFOs in Wartime. Uh, is, so, what what are your opinions about these secret bases? You think they're out there beyond Area Fifty One? Um, every one of them that we mentioned in the book, I think we mentioned probably about 20 of them or so, mm-hmm. uh, they are definitely out there. You know, there's enough evidence uh, to be found on all of them that they do exist, that um, the unusual thing about them is that um, I think we talk about eight or nine in the U.S. and then um, the rest are overseas. Almost every single one of these secret bases has some kind of a history with UFOs. That's very strange. I mean, we always equate... Area 51 with UFOs and so on, but there's a place up in um, um, there's a place up in the northern part of Nevada called Tonopah Air Force Base that is so secret that the people who work there aren't allowed to go into the town. There's a town nearby Tonopah, Nevada. They're not allowed to mix with the uh, locals. Let's say um, you can't spend a credit card in Tonopah if you work at Tonopah Air Force Base. This is where they um, tested the stealth fighter for years, uh, for 10 years, without anyone knowing about it. Um, there were places down in uh, St. Louis Valley in southwest Colorado that uh, it's, it's an area, St. Louis Valley is an area that is ringed by military bases. There's so much paranormal activity going on there that it's hard to keep up with it. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. They see everything from UFOs to Bigfoot to flying humans and stuff. There's always military planes around. Um, um, there's a places down in off of uh, Florida where the U.S. Navy, you know, um, tests its uh, captains to, uh, to, who are taking over new su- nuclear submarines, see how far down they can go, see how the equipment works at, at great depth. They do it in this kind of trench in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. There's been hundreds, many hundreds of UFO reports down around that place for the past 30 years or so. It's just very interesting that anywhere there is one of these secret bases, there are, there's a UFO history attached to it. And you always say, well, what, what came first, you know? Yeah. Did we attract the UFOs or did we build the base there because UFOs were there before? I, that was a, that was an amazing piece of research we came upon while we were doing the book. I don't think anyone really realized before. Fascinating, really. Well, the best example was Rendlesham. Everyone thinks that was uh, you know back in 1980 with uh, you know the Peter Robbins book Left at Eastgate, but actually that whole forest area, Rendlesham Forest, was uh, supposedly haunted or different UFO activities and so on many years before that. And right. there were secret yeah. nukes there as well yeah. at the time, yeah. so that's worthy of mm-hmm. consideration. It's in the East Anglia part of um, of the uh, of, of Great Britain, and you just go back into their history. There, there were unbelievable UFO sightings there in the late fifties, where the U.S. would scramble jets to um, they they would see on their radar what looked like hundreds of Russian bombers coming, you know, towards England, and they would scramble just and they went there, and there and there were UFOs. Um, there's something about East Anglia that, you know, is a they, in, in England they call it an old place, but meaning it's a place where just odd things happen. Um, Roslyn, Scotland, yeah. up, yes, um, yes, yeah. you know, more UFOs are seen in that area than any other place in the world. Amazing. And it just happens to be where Roslyn Chapel is that's, you know, connected to the Knights Templar. So, you know, who knows? That's what I mean. If you really kind of look at it, a lot of these places have UFO histories, and a lot of those places where they built these bases have histories that go back further than the base itself. Um, I don't know. Once again, if someone could just connect all these dotted lines sometime in our lifetimes, I think it would be a very, very fascinating result. Well, I read uh, Dan Brown's book, of course, The Da Vinci Code, and so I was really captured by it and uh, did go to Roslyn Chapel in Scotland. And the, it is probably one of the oddest religious um, institutions or buildings I've ever been in. But aside from that, it's way in the middle of nowhere. It's a very small mm-hmm. building. And the walls are covered with visiting dignitaries. And what would cause so many people to visit this little, tiny, out-of-the-way place? 
I mean, something had to have drawn them all there, and these are all various heads of states and their pictures and the dates that they were there on the wall. So I think at a higher governmental level, some of the people are aware of this and actually pay homage to these whatever they are. Uh Uh-oh, we're going into Bilderberg territory. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, there's Bill the Berg, there's Bill the Bear, you know. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm just, I'm just joking. I'm just being myself. But it is true. I mean, there is definitely some sort of, act. well, to me, a conspiracy is rich, powerful people getting together to stay more rich and more powerful. Yeah, well, there's and, a lot of that going on. And that's <laughs> happened throughout history, and it will happen as long as there's humans. I mean, that, that's just a part of a human civilization. Uh, somebody's going to rise up, get money and power, and they're going to try to keep it. And uh, that's that's our history. The thing about yeah. your idea of it being um, uh, somebody coming through history, a, a time traveler, mm. it's very... Um, uh, it's very optimistic view as far as I can see because uh, we seem to be making such a mess of things. It's encouraging to think that somebody might be going back in time 200 years from now when, frankly, you know, my own view of things somewhat says, gee, I wonder if there will be any humans then. Right. I mean, uh, one of the people I talked to when I was doing the second book, Beyond Area 51, this guy who just happened to be a neighbor of mine, he was a uh, physicist. He was a veteran of World War II, some really odd fighting in World War II, and he says he saw so much death and destruction mm-hmm. that when he came out of the service, he became a, a, a minister, and then he became a physicist. And when he read the book, he said you know, he said the exact same thing. He says, you have a very optimistic point of view because if they're from the future, that means we have a future. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Speaking of the future, maybe you could tell us what's on the burner now, Mr. <laughs> Mac Maloney. Yeah. Any um, more books coming out? No, you know, no more UFO books coming okay. out. Um, I do my own, I don't want to uh, sound like I'm the competition, but I do my own radio uh, show that's uh-huh. uh, syndicated on uh, the Military Appreciation Channel and Armed Forces Radio Network next year. Cool. Uh, it's called the Mac Maloney Military X-Files show, but listen to Kate's show first and then my show second. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, you. the way Please. that I, I look at this, um, you know, having working with Kate now on Shattered Reality, which is our program that you're on right now, is that... Um, by so many people using the Internet to disperse information, uh, if you are uh, a, an educated listener and, and, you know, can throw out some of the dross there, um, it gives an opportunity for the average person to be heard, the average person with an opinion of some sort, and perhaps to disseminate information that the mass media does not wish to disseminate for reasons only known to the, themselves. I mean, I'm not saying it's all a conspiracy, but um, certainly the Internet gives us this option. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, I, I think that, um, you know, um, well, at the end of one of the books, we asked five of the uh, leading UFO authors what they thought the UFO puzzle would be solved. And it's funny because they all said in about 30 or 40 years. Oh. Um, they think that it will be at that point, uh, especially Jerry Clark, who I look at it as a very respected author. Yes, and researcher. yes, absolutely. He, he, he said that he thinks up in, in that time, uh, 2040, 2050, that the stigma of southern UFOs will be gone for scientists. And uh, as mm-hmm. you were saying before, you know, try to get a grant for that. Well, maybe it won't be that hard in, you know, three or four decades to get a grant to study UFOs, to figure out what they do, who they are, you know, everything we can possibly learn about them. Take the stigma away from that. And then maybe you will just get to that one little kernel of truth that is going to reveal the whole thing. The downside of that is that it probably isn't going to be an American scientist who does that. There's a better chance it's going to be a Chinese scientist or an Indian scientist. The Indians because they are going forward in their scientific yeah. programs, and we're going backwards. It's, it's too bad, but that's just the, that's just the fact now. Unless something turns around very quickly, you know, the puzzle of UFOs might not be solved by Americans. It might be solved by something in, someone in Asia. Well, they say that uh, science moves ahead one funeral at a time. So uh, I wonder <laughs> if this could be part of the uh, the prediction. 
uh, some of the people who have tried to uh, stigmatize the study will then be passed out of uh, existence. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the stigma is gone because of today's, uh, all these various Xbox and games that the children play all involve extraterrestrials. For them, the idea of an extraterrestrial is sort of commonplace. They don't even think twice about it. I I was fortunate enough to be at a a speech uh, given by uh, Edgar Mitchell, Uh, the former astronaut and the Ph.D. from MIT, uh, Mm -hmm. when he gave a a speech to uh, many of the students from the Aeronautic High School in Long Island City, the New York City, uh, I'm I'm not quite getting the name of the high school correct, but it was, I think it's the High School of Aeronautics. But these were people, uh, young men and women, who were planning to become uh, pilots and maybe go in the Air Force or uh, uh, pursue a career in aeronautics. And he spoke to them with, uh, you know, no uncertain terms that part of their future would have to be dealing with um, extraterrestrial uh, life or intelligence. So um, we'll we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, free-thinking people, I mean, the world is is becoming more populated with free-thinking people. There's no doubt about it. The the generation is going to be coming after this one and after the next, you know, has had so much information at their fingertips, stuff that, you know, I know when I was growing up, we couldn't even imagine it. You know, now you just snap your fingers, push a button, and and, and it's there. And I think that that gives people the opportunity to kind of, you know, take in ideas that maybe not, you know, uh, be uh, so... um, I don't know, normal, let's say. You know, maybe they think there's people the idea that, hey, let's go out and look at these strange things. They've always been around. No one's ever really looked at them in a scientific way. Why don't we do it? Um, I, I think it's, it's, it's too bad, but I think Jerry Clark is probably right. 30 to 40 years from now, someplace in Beijing or uh, Bombay, uh, someone will kind of break the puzzle. Hmm. At nineteen four or 2040 is going to be a little late for me, so let's hope it's before then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're It'd be great live... if, it be, if it was tomorrow, you know. You're going to I mean, live forever, gonna... Kate, I think. Yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, well, I, I don't know. I I do suspect that the world, you know, everyone says, oh, this new world order is such a horrible thing, and, you know, we're all going to be under the thumbs of some universal dictator. But I think, actually, the computers is going to be the ruler of the new world order, and the people are just going to be people. And... Uh, I I I don't think it's it, you know obviously it could be a horrendous thing it could also be a very good thing you know Stephen well, uh, like everything else in history it's going to be a little bit of both mm, you know okay That's I'll go with how that goes. yeah but I think it's almost unavoidable at this point I I think national boundaries are starting to just fall apart the famous mm-hmm. physicist Stephen Hawking just recently came out with a, uh, uh, he felt that the artificial intelligence might uh, kind of uh, take us down the wrong path and become our masters. He did warn of that recently. Not that, you know, I mean, he's a brilliant man, but not that I, I take his word, you know, beyond anything else. But it's certainly when somebody of that acumen uh, comes to say something, you kind of pay attention. And by the way, my friend and teacher from uh, the past is uh, Mr. Tom Campbell, who wrote my mm-hmm. big toe. So I want to be on record oh, okay. with saying that he's, <laughs> I hope he'll be our guest someday too. <laughs> well, you know, certainly Kurzweil agrees with you. He wrote The uh, the Coming Singularity. And uh, to him, it's just a given that eventually we will, not we, but uh, the, the ruling class on this planet will be silicon-based, and not carbon-based. And um, maybe they're the ones that are the travelers from the future. Uh, maybe they wanted to know how they evolved and where they came from. And, uh, you know, it, it, if you have enough intelligence, I think eventually you develop curiosity. And uh, that, that may be the way they're expressing it. Mm-hmm. It could be. And, and there's a lot more intelligent people on the Earth right now than there were 20 years ago because... What we can get on our internet, somebody in the middle of Ghana can get on their internet too. Yeah, you know, yeah. and, and and it's everywhere. You can just pull out, pull down anything you want, and that's just going to lead to a lot of people with a lot of great ideas, forward-thinking, hopefully more forward-thinking people than you know politicians or whatever. Um, it's going to be interesting. Um, you know, maybe we can be time travelers someday and come back and see it, or um, or our descendants will be. Well, I think on that 
happy and hopeful and optimistic note at this time of the year. I don't know when this recording will come out, but right now we're enjoying the whole holiday season here. And uh, I I would certainly like to thank you so much for speaking with you again. It's always a pleasure. Yes, and and I would like to thank you too. And if you want to tell us your website, if you want to put that out um, for our listeners, Mm -hmm. please do. Uh, Best place to go is MacMaloney.com. And that brings you to everything else. Terrific. Wonderful. Thanks again. Have a great season. And uh, You too. Thanks very much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Always a pleasure. Take care. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. You'll agree with me that Mac Maloney is one of our more interesting, uh, or I guess all of our speakers are interesting, but he has such a diverse and wide wealth of knowledge and uh, just, just he seems to be uh, very versatile in almost all the fields of ufology. Indeed, he is. But uh, our next guest coming up in the uh, first part of January is a lot more specific. It is Mr. Robert Schroeder, and he will talk about solving the UFO enigma. Uh, Bob Schroeder is interesting in that he is not a physicist, but physics is his hobby, which is a little bit different, and he has uh, an absolute, I think, proof of how UFOs work, and he calls his proof the bulk. The bulk was also mentioned in that recent movie, Interstellar, so I'm looking forward very much to speaking to Bob Schroeder again. Well, I'm looking forward to this uh, new adventure, too, in 2015. Um, Now, I want to speak to our uh, listeners and tell them that Your feedback is extremely important to us. Mm -hmm. So we would like to hear from you. And uh, we'd also like to hear about your experiences. And to that end, we have two places for you to go. The first place is our actual webpage, which is, and this is going to be the internet address, shatteredrealitypodcast.wordpress.com. Dot com. That's no spaces in there. Shattered Reality Podcast dot WordPress dot com. And that's the hub of our show where you can listen to previous episodes and hopefully future episodes. But it's also a place where you can have a comment um, or you can write down your experience, and we really want to hear from you and for you to share share things with us of that nature. The other place that we'd like you to go to is our Facebook page, where you can get to on Facebook simply by typing in the words Shattered Reality into the search bar in Uh, Facebook, and then you're going to come up with several different pages, one of which is going to indicate that it is a radio station. In fact, it is us. Uh, Strangely enough, um, Facebook, which is, uh, you know, a a social media site of the 21st century, they're still back in um, the 20th century instead of the 21st because they have no designation for a podcast. So I was forced to designate our page as a radio station. The other, the other shattered realities are bands. A couple of bands have that name out there, and it's a good name. We chose it. So please look for us on WordPress, uh, WordPress shattered reality podcast.wordpress.com, and also on Facebook, shattered reality radio station. Uh, and I also ask you to please like our Facebook page. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to speaking to all of you in 2015. Yep. See you then. Shattered Reality.